Uh, hey, Craig, uh, thanks a lot for the intro. Uh, do you hear me okay? I hope everybody hears me okay. Yep. Um, yep. Okay, cool. Um, so, obviously, we're talking about functional occlusion in the digital aids here today. But I think one thing that's going on is that somehow digital has has created this 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 idea that a lot of the things that, that I know I spent my entire career learning and that you know have been you know staple uh, um, things in our industry aren't so important anymore. And and you know from um, you know proper occlusion, proper function. Uh, I talk to people today, they think they can take a library tooth, stick it on a prep, kind of cut it to occlusion, cut it to contacts, and they're done. And a lot of that is going on. But but still, the rules that we've learned over all these years and what goes on in the mouth, that hasn't changed. And so, but how do we bring this to bear in the, in the digital age? Because this is different. And I know that the virtual articulation um, uh, program uh, within 3Shape, which is what I'll be talking about, which is what I use, um, is actually um, got its own kind of personality. And we're going to talk about that in more detail uh, next week. Today, I really want to talk about function and occlusion. And, and again, I think today what we're doing is probably better referred to as a practical approach to function and occlusion. Because really, you know, you can get mired down in so many details and bogged down into stuff. And I think sometimes people look at articulators and look at occlusion as something that's mysterious and hard to understand. And, and it can't be presented that way. But I think that, you know, if we break it down into its basic components, we'll find that really we can really improve what we're doing and the results we're getting if we just understand a few key things and kind of understand how this whole thing works. But again, when I talk about practical, you know, that brings up a question about what does it mean to be practical? And I decided I would I would pull in. Uh, I hope you all are familiar, at least somewhat familiar with the Panky Institute down in Miami and L.D. Panky, who was an amazing visionary in our industry. You know, he has since passed away. But he, he said something to me one time that I thought was quite profound. He says perfectionism is, is an obsessive compulsive disorder. It's an impossible pursuit. Our goal should always be to strive for excellence. And so it really becomes our responsibility to fully educate ourselves so that we can understand and choose the most practical, efficient path towards quality and excellence. OK, so what we want to be able to do is really make the right decisions, kind of find our way through the quagmire of information and, and land in a place where we can really apply the kinds of things we need to apply to our work to make it at the level we want it, yet um, not get bogged down in, in, in details that really are not practical. And so this involves involves kind of bringing a balance into our perspective and into the way that we approach dental technology, and in this case, occlusion. Um, <clears throat> I'm hearing a little talking in the very background. Does anybody, where's that coming from? Does anybody know? It's a little bit distracting. But anyway, um, so if we look at articulators, they really provide two main utilities to the technician. One, of course, is functional, which is involved in the movements of the mandible relative to the maxilla. But the other is perceptual. It has to do with the alignments of the, of the uh, cases that we're doing, particularly anterior and small line cases, to really help us define the horizontal and vertical so we can produce uh, small design cases or interior cases that have the right incisal plane to go well in the patient's mouth and to not be a failure, uh, which is really what we want. And a lot of this involves control and, and making sure that we, we keep this um, in the forefront at all times. But the human masticatory system is a remarkably elegant system. And generally, I don't read a lot of my slides per se, but this one I think is is, is quite powerful. Through an interplay of mechanical and geometrical structures in conjunction with muscles, nerves, proprioception, and biofeedback, it allows us to do many things quite eloquently, to chew our food, to use our voices, and to interact socially. So there's a lot going on in this area that we work with every day. And, you know, we can uh, improve people's lives. We can really mess up their lives, not just physically, but socially, if we, um, you know, screw up their case for example. But when it comes to mastication, the entire system is specifically designed to allow the person to efficiently masticate food. 
utilizing the anterior teeth for tearing and biting without having the posterior grinding teeth hit together during chewing in uncomfortable or destructive ways known as interferences. In other words, to function for many years without destroying itself. And, and that's the key, to efficiently masticate without destroying itself. And so when we talk about articulators and talk about occlusion and talk about function and, and, and talk about all these things, it's all part of, uh, of the, the tools that we use to accomplish this when we're doing restorative cases. So the question becomes, how do we keep from screwing all this up when replacing one or more teeth? And it's really not uh, all that easy sometimes, but, but if we understand certain things about how this whole system works, then we can uh, really start to improve the results that we're getting and what we're delivering to really to patients, you know, not just to our clients, but ultimately to the patients. And what we do actually affects their lives in big ways. But if we look at this whole system, there are two distinct and separate things that work together. There's, there's a, a posterior component of occlusion of function, which consists of the, the mandibular condyles and the eminence in the skull, the temporal eminence of the skull. That comprises the posterior component, and the anterior component of, of mastication is the lower anterior incisal edges moving along the lingual surfaces of the maxillary teeth, or in other words, anterior guidance, as we've come to call it, okay? But these two things are completely separate, and we're going to look at them one at a time. But working together, they allow for all the things that we're familiar with, right lateral, left lateral, protrusive, and everything in between. So these two systems work together to allow um, everything that happens, whether it's mastication, speech, uh, interactions, anything in, in, in the oral environment take place, depend on these two systems working together in harmony. So let's take a look at how this all works, how it's designed, and what the components are. Okay, so, you know, really we can break this down into two basic things, the skull and the mandible. But more specifically, if we look at the skull in particular, the, the maxilla, <clears throat> uh, which is uh, part of the anterior component of mastication, and then we have the temporal bone, which when we look closer houses the, the resting place for the, um, for the condyles of the, of the ma uh, mandible. And so if we look at this, and just for a quick review of some of our uh, anatomy here, we have the glenoid fossa, which is where the head of the condyle sits. We have the eminence, which provides the concert guidance, which we're familiar with. The articular tuberosity, which, which is sort of the anterior stop, so the condyle cannot go past that. And then, of course, uh, the eminence um, is at a certain angle, and we call that the concert guidance angle. And in skulls, it averages 40 to 60 degrees, I think quite often more towards the higher number. And so if we look and overlay the articulator in here, it's designed exactly the same way. It has a glenoid fossa up and back. It has an eminence or conjure guiding angle. It has an articular tuberosity, which is a, uh, an anterior stop. But generally, we set these uh, conjure guidances at, at somewhere between 20 and 30 degrees, typically. And so if we look at that, you know, we ask ourselves, well, why do we do that? Why do we set a, a machine that's designed to be just like uh, the human skull um, differently than what is normally there physiologically. And that question we'll get to as we move through this presentation. So looking at the, at the underside of the skull here, we can see that we have also these actual anatomical things, the fossa, the image, the tuberosity are visible. And then the medial wall is at an angle, and that's called the Bennett angle. And this has some important implications as to the way the uh, the, the the function uh, the ma the ma mandible functions relative to the maxilla, the fact that we have this angle here. And so, what I want to do is take a look at how these things work and what these different angles and what these different anatomical structures do to influence the way that our teeth move relative to each other. Okay, so. Uh, when we look at the mandible, however, the parts we're concerned with in the posterior component is the conjular head, and in the anterior component, again, are the teeth. And so these are really the two things that allow <coughs> the maxilla and the, and the mandible to uh, work together. So we see that when we put the actual uh, anatomy onto the articulator that we really do have a machine 
that's built just like the human the human head and actually duplicates the geometry of that in a way that allows our teeth to move very similar to the way they do in the actual uh, uh, patient, in the actual head. So <clears throat> let's take a look at some of these movements of the posterior determinant, the condylenoid fossa, and sort of kind of see what happens as we make some changes, that we do some things and look at the way this movement really happens. Okay, and the first um concept that we all are kind of familiar with is centric relation but centric relation is quite uh controversial in fact a a a well-known definition is the maxillomandibular relationship in which the condyles articulate with the thinnest a vascular portion of the respective discs with the complex in the anterior superior position against the shapes of articular eminences in the glenoid fossa i almost can't even read that okay and i look at that and I go, what in the heck is that? I mean, I really, I really don't really understand exactly necessarily what's going on here. And, and the point I want to make is that for our purposes, understanding this is not really necessarily very important. Now, if I'm a dentist and I'm working with with pathology in the joint, that's a whole different thing. Okay, but for us, we need to get practical about what do we really need to know about syndic relation in order to utilize it to our advantage and to 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 put it where it does us the most good. Okay, so for for me, I I feel like we should be able to assume that centric occlusion or MIP and centric relation coincide, so that you know when the articulator is locked in centric, <coughs> the condyles are up and back. That's what we call centric, <coughs> and. It's usually in the patient, you know, it's usually more of an acquired centric. It's a place where they've become comfortable, where the teeth fit well, the joint's comfortable. And a lot of times the actual patient, the position of the condyle is not actually up and back. But for us, that's an argument that we don't need to get involved with. OK, we're going to assume that when the condyle articulator is locked and when the patient's in centric occlusion, MIP, that's what we're going to call centric. Okay, center conclusion for the most part. And again, the kind of the movements that go on of the mandible <laughs> relative to the maxilla are very complex and they involve so many variables that truly trying to duplicate this precisely on a machine is really not even possible. I mean, they can't function the way the, 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 the human head functions, but we can duplicate the basic geometrical movements and come to understand what they're doing and how to use them to our advantage, right? Because we want to stay practical. We want to distill out of all this what we find useful and put it to use in our everyday lives, okay? And so, the basic movements that we have we're all familiar with are simple open and close, right? Where it's just simple hinge axis movement, uh, open and close, click, click, right? Although usually on the articulator, we move the upper for convenience. That's what we do. I mean, that's not what happens in life, but it's all the same. It does not matter which part of the articulator you actually move to tap, tap into centric. And so now when we start looking at other movements, like lateral and protrusive movements, they start to get just a little more complex. And I, and I want to just show some basic under, ideas here of what goes on when we do this <clears throat> so that you can see how we can apply what we learn here to things that we do with our articulator when we're adjusting cases. So I also want to put up above the actual condyles from the side view. Again, the condylar head is a little round ball. The mandible is the little triangle. Okay, so that ball is that ball, and that's our conjure guidance angle up there. Okay, and we're going to look at a right lateral movement. And <clears throat> so as we do this, here's the th important things to, to, to be aware of. Number one, so we've got, we've got a right lateral movement, so the working condyle on the right doesn't move which is almost like an oxymoron. It's called the working condyle, but it doesn't move. It simply rotates. The one that moves or translates is the non-working condyle or balancing condyle on the, on the other side of the arch. That's a very important concept to always understand, <laughs> that it's the non-working side that actually moves, not the side to which the mandible is moving. And at the same time, while it's moving forward, the, the non-working condyle is moving forward, it's also moving down. And the amount that it moves down is dependent upon what the conjugate guidance angle is. The steeper the angle, the more it moves down. And of course, when it goes back to centric, it everything goes the other way. The, the uh, working condyle rotates back, 
the not working condyle translates back into the fossa and we're back in centric. And so the same thing happens with the other side, the other movement, left lateral movement. Again, same thing. The working condyle rotates, the non working condyle translates down the eminence, okay? And it also moves downward. And again, downward by the amount uh, based on the level of the contour guidance. The steeper the guidance, the more physically it moves down as it moves forward. And as we go through this program, we're going to see how understanding this is the key to understanding a lot of how to better adjust our cases and better design our cases. And again, protrusive, we're moving both condyles forward. Okay, and protrusive back into the fossa. And of course, we move both condyles downward as well. But there's an interesting side note to the protrusive movement, and that is the Bennett component. Because the medial wall of the skull is angled inward at about 15 degrees, as the condyle moves down the eminence, there's space on the inside of it. And so it can move sideways back and forth. Okay, it can actually do a movement like that. So it gets a little more complicated, and it's important to understand this and to utilize this when we're looking at setting articulators and going through um, adjusting occlusion. So if we look at all possible places that a condyle can be, that's what we've all, always described as the envelope of function. But if we look at it, it's actually a triangle. Okay, the area is actually triangular. And so Anywhere within this zone is where either one of the condyles can be at any given time, taking the teeth relative to each other to those same places. And the teeth need to be in harmony with these movements. And if we, if we fail to do that, it's going to create a lot of problems. Okay, so let's look at posterior component movements. Let's see what happens as we start to, to move teeth based on this geometry. So for our first example, we're going to look at a guidance of 10 degrees, okay, a very steep guidance, no teeth, just a maxilla, and if we go on protrusion, look what happens. They just slide along each other, and there's no posterior disclusion, no function, there's very little going on. It's a really, really, really simple system. So let's look at this again, though. Let's just increase conjugate guidance, and again, here we have no anterior component, right? We're looking at just the posterior component of occlusion, just the, the condyle and the fossa. And when we increase to 30, we do get just a little bit of posterior disclusion. But certainly nowhere near enough to disclude teeth, posterior teeth and function. So while the posterior component is independent and functions independently of the anterior, they require each other to work properly. So let's add some anterior guidance. Let's put a tooth on this and see what happens. Okay, so we'll just put a little tooth, a little bit of an inclined lingual up on the maxilla. Put the guidance back at 10 degrees and let's try this now. Now look what happens, okay? Really interesting. Now we get we get more posterior disclusion even though the function of the, uh, uh, of the posterior component hasn't changed. It's still at 10 degrees. All we did was add some anterior component to this system, okay? And we indeed start to achieve now some posterior disclusion, which is extremely important. Okay, that we have posterior teeth move away from each other as we're in, involved in mastication and move outside of centric in any kind of a movement. If we increase our guidance, <coughs> excuse me, to 30 degrees, I think you can imagine what happens. We suddenly get, we have the same anterior component. Nothing has changed there. We've changed the posterior component, and now we get more posterior disclusion by increasing the amount of conjugate guidance. So while this seems simple, these, these concepts are extremely important. Now, what about a steep tooth? What about steep anterior guidance? And sometimes we call this locked in, um, a locked in type of occlusion. What happens in this situation? Okay, keep ourselves more physiologic at 30 degrees. Okay, longer, steeper tooth. Let's try this. And interestingly, when we do this, we get less posterior disclusion. Why? Why, if we increase the anterior um, <clears throat> steepness of the anterior guidance, why do we get less disclusion um, between these two scenarios? And the only reason is because with a locked-in bite, like we see here on the bottom, the mandible can't move as far because it gets stopped. And, we, and therefore, since we can't go as far down the eminence, we can't move the mandible as far down. Uh, and so we get less separation of the teeth. Again, simple concepts, 
but really important. And I think sometimes, you know, we'll, we'll have known this stuff for a long time, but we've never really stopped to put it together and understand how it actually uh, affects what we do and how we should use this to improve what we do and improve uh, our results that go into the patient's mouth. So <clears throat> when we talk about the anterior determinant, which is really the incisal guidance, it's the lower incisors right along the inclines of the upper. Again, remember me saying that this is independent of posterior guidance, and it is 100% independent. And as just an example of kind of how this works, um, we're going to take this little hose holder, and we're going to call that uh, the maxillary. We're, we're going to pretend this green thing is the is the inclines of the of the lingual of the maxillary teeth, and the little uh, purple rake are the inci lower incisal edges. And so, if we drag this along, um, if we drag the incisal edges along the linguals of the upper, it follows a path. It follows this curved path, and it just does what it does. Okay, and we could call the angle handle the, the guidance angle, right? So, what if we try this again and we lower the guidance angle we lower that handle down when we drag those those teeth along the path it follows the exact same path nothing changes right so whether we have a lower guidance angle or a higher guidance angle <clears throat> that function that movement that path of the anterior component doesn't change okay but it does affect what goes on with the teeth because it's never by itself. It's always in conjunction with the posterior guidance. So in an attempt to kind of start to pull this together, let's take a look at how the teeth are actually arranged in the head and then, and then start putting this all together. So <clears throat> horizontally, I mean, ideally, the teeth should be have no situs I can't. It should be parallel to the eyes and to the orbits, to the interocular line. Okay. And then we have a Frankfurt plane that goes to the meatus of the ear to the tip of the nose, and perpendicular to that is what we decide, what we call the vertical axis. That's how that's defined. From the ear hole to the tip of the nose uh, creates uh, the horizontal plane, and then a perpendicular to that is the vertical axis. Okay. The maxilla. <clears throat> typically, these are all averages that come from Bonwell, is at a, at a 10 degree down tilt from the horizontal. And these are all anatomical averages. Uh, it should be 110 millimeters from the uh, head of the condyle to the central incisor of the maxilla. And again, interestingly, the interconjular width is also average 110 millimeters. Okay, um, I just kind of found that interesting. But anyway, uh, when we add the mandible in, uh, we find that really the, the occlusal plane at the level of the cuspid or central incisor really should pretty much split the, dif the distance between the, the horizontal plane, the Frankfurt horizontal plane, and the bottom of the <clears throat> mandible. And like I said, all these are averages that come from Bonwell. So <clears throat> this is important to understand that we can utilize these averages to really help us in our daily work. So how do we, if we have a case, how do we get the teeth into the articulator the same way that they are in the patient's head? Well, obviously, as we know, there's a, uh, we can use a face bow. And that pretty much captures the position of the maxilla in most cases relative to the ears. Okay, we use the ear canal instead of the condyles in the back, but it's a, it's a, it's a, a tried and true way to transfer that relationship. Or we can use the mounting platform also called an occlusal stand, which puts the maxilla in a place based on those averages that we just looked at. Now, which is right and which is wrong? <clears throat> and what are the implications of these two different ways of doing this? Okay, we're going to jump into that here in just a sec, but the point here being you never, never <clears throat> put a case into an articulator arbitrarily because you're locked into these movements. You have a locked contra guidance. You, 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 have, you have a rigid system that's not going to allow the, mac, the mandible to move outside of its ranges. And if we have our, mar, our arches in the wrong place, they're not going to move right. In fact, it'll be worse than if we're just using a, a plastic hinge of some kind, like a vertex, or, or nothing at all, just hand-holding casts. So... <clears throat> When we look at this occlusal stand, again, it's based completely on these same exact averages they're taking from the skull, right? 110 millimeters vertically centered, 10 degree tilt, exactly everything, all, all the averages that come from Bonwell, you know, who spent years studying skulls. And I'm really happy he did because he, he gave us his information. And it works out pretty good. But if we're looking at 
<clears throat> then I got a clusal stand, which is an average placement of the maxilla, versus a face bow, which should be a physiologic placement. There's there's places where both are okay. Let's take a look at this case here. Here's a case where we obviously obviously have an incisal plane issue, right? She is uh, worn off at an angle. She's shorter on on one side than the other. She's actually shorter on her left side. And so, in a situation like this, it's extremely important that we get a way to duplicate that malalignment in the in the articulator so we can correct it. So a face bow is always necessary when we're doing diagnostic or corrective cases. And so, you know, when we get a case from a doctor like this, it should include the face bow, photos, models, uh, PBS, of course. These days, there's a lot going on digitally, and that can really become complex because how do we get that all these relationships into our software? That's another trick, okay? Uh, so <clears throat> for the purposes of this, we're going to go with, you know, um, gypsum models and, and, and analog procedures. So from here, if we get the case mounted on the articulator exactly the same way it is in the mouth, now we can see the problem. We can fix the problem. We can do a diagnostic wax up and provide a clinical proposal <coughs> to the doctor and go right to the temporaries, okay, uh, based on the information we got from the proper mounting of the cast. Sometimes we have other issues, we have to move some teeth, we have to do some surgery, there could be things going on that don't allow us to actually put the teeth where we want. Patient may have to you know, go through that on a side, but ultimately we come back to the same step. We deliver this, the doctor makes the temps, and the patient wears those, they accept those, the doctor adjusts them, does whatever's necessary over a little period of time, and then boom, we're good. We get a study model. Occasionally, I hate this. The doc will say, "Hey, I need you to lengthen this tooth, that tooth." The temps weren't right. He ins he put them in a little bit crooked. That's a little bit of a problem when this happens. I, I really don't like this. If I see a situation like this, I kind of prefer to go back to uh, up at the Facebook and kind of start over. But we don't always have that convenience. At any rate. So once we have it corrected, we have everything okay, we have the temps, we have all the temporaries that are accepted by the patient, and they are horizontal, they are flat, and they do uh, fit well on the patient's face. At this point, we can mount our actual case using an occlusal stand because it has certain advantages. It, it always puts our model straight, always puts it horizontal, always puts the midline in the center because <clears throat> it's a... It's a a geometrical platform and then from here we we go through our processes we make our aesthetic controls we make our guide tables our matrices and we produce our case hopefully that actually mimics exactly the horizontal plane the patient's looking for that we're looking for the vertical axis for the midline and it's all good and we get a very successful case that goes in the mouth fixes the problems and looks good i mean this is the ideal right now take a look at this <clears throat> okay here's a patient who really doesn't have the prettiest teeth. But if we look at the incisal plane and we look at the midline, we look at these things, it ain't bad, okay? There's not really much to correct here. Is she a little long back on her bicuspids? Mm, you know, probably not. I mean, it's probably part of her smile. Yeah, I get a lot of cases I'm doing small design and it's really not, there's nothing to correct. So in this case, really, I can get a study model of that and go straight to the occlusal stand because it's going to put the, the, the incisal plane, the occlusal plane of the upper horizontal to the tabletop. It's going to put the midline in the center. It's going to give me exactly what I'm trying to reproduce, which is not changing anything. Just keep it level and don't screw it up. And so, again, same process. We produce our set of controls. We go to the crowds and complete the case. Okay, in both ways, these are two different approaches, but the bottom line was we want to have control over two things, the vertical and the horizontal, uh, the vertical axis, the horizontal plane, so that when we produce a case and it goes to the mouth, it fits right, it looks right, it's not crooked, it's not canted, okay? And sometimes face bows, they're not as easy as you think, and they're not, they're not always so great. They can, they can easily be off. They can get moved in the mail. They can get... Um, 
taken improperly by the doctor. A lot can go wrong with face bows, whereas with the with an occlusal stand. And this one here you see was our first prototype when we didn't have one that was actually made for the articulator. That has since changed. This is an old picture, uh, but shows kind of where we started with this whole idea. And again, the use of that ensures that the occlusal plane will be will be perfect in the articulator so we can use it as a tool to make our crowns perfectly level and make the midline perfectly straight up. But if we have to do correction, this is no good because we got to see where it's coming from. And that takes me into a little word about stick bites here. I'm sure everybody has seen stick bites and they know what we're talking about. And the problem is that is the fact that it's taken as a bite. And here's what I mean. When I get a stick bite and they're almost always taken as a bite. So they have uh, indentations from both the mandibular and maxillary teeth in them. They fit in between the two. The only time I can use it is after I have uh, mounted the case and then I can stick it on and the best thing they do for me is tell me that I'm wrong okay ah oh, man this mounting's off and now what okay now I need to knock this model off and try to compensate and try to guess okay we got to tilt a little more to the left here we got to bring that side down bring that side up and remount it and then it's off a little bit the other way we've all been through it so what we do is we tend to or I do you know sort of ignore uh, stick bites unless they're taken properly and here's the way you want to take a stick bite which is not as a bite but to index it on the mid facial, the centrals. The key here being to leave the incisal ledges exposed. Okay, once the incisal ledges are exposed with your stick bite, okay, now you can put this thing on the model while it's either on the face bow <clears throat> or on the mounting stand. All right, and now we know what a horizontal axis is. So uh, if we put this on our face bow and this stick is not horizontal, well, the face bow is not correct. OK, and then we have to backtrack and figure that one out, you know, talk to the doc about what do you want me to do here? This is not correct. And in this particular case, we can see we got to lift up the left side just a little bit to get that stick straight. And uh, there is a new occlusal platform that allows you to, to tilt it uh, left to right a little bit to accomplish this. Back in the day, we would use a little bit of putty, whatever it takes to get the, the stick straight. Once you get the stick straight, now you know that your, your incisal plate is going to be exactly the way it was in the mouth so long as the doctor got the stick straight, okay? We depend on each other to do this right. And so <clears throat> once we get this stick bite, and here's another way to do it, okay? But again, you know, he maybe indexed this a little bit too far apical, but it works. It's away from the incisal ledges. And then when, in my virtual articulator, I can actually scan my pre prep scan with the stick in place. Now I have a horizontal axis to adjust my cast inside my virtual articulator. And this I'll just show real quick, but we're going to talk more, much more about this in the second installation of this of this uh, series next week. But here's a case where we got a proper um, uh, stick bow or face bite. We got this case mounted properly. There's a definitely an incisal cant to this case. We have some correction to do. And if it, when we get the clinical picture, we superimpose these to uh, see that indeed what we have on the articulator is what we have uh, from the patient's mouth. And again, this picture is no good if the doctor doesn't take it right. Okay, we have to take the picture properly to be able to, to, to know that we can have this exactly well. And even just even just a photo to look at on the screen, you don't have to bring it into your software and superimpose it. Um, just a visual verification that, yeah, this looks pretty good is really, really, really important. So then we can do the diagnostics. We have articulator helps us. We have the horizontal, the vertical. We create the wax up. We create the case and we're successful. Now, I'm going to di digress just a little tiny bit here and talk about clinical photos. What I want to show you is what, what you need to do, and you can share this with your accounts, and to take a proper clinical photo. And so what we do is have the patient stand up and tell them to straighten their head. And they never have it straight. So you need to say no, a little bit left of this. Okay, there you go. And they always think it feels funny because 
nobody stands up with their head straight. And if you have something horizontal in the background, that's nice too because it helps you define the horizontal axis. But the key to this is to, is, is to have a monopod on your camera. You move up to the patient. You set the foot of the monopod down so the camera is exactly at the same height as their maxillary incisal size ledge. That's where you set the camera, okay? Then you back up to take the photos. <clears throat> now, when you look through, how do you know if you're leaning the camera forward or, or pulling it back a little bit? You can see she has the camera backwards just a little bit in this picture. And that's really easy if you turn on your grid lines because since the camera is at the same height as the teeth, you should see your little focus ring or your little center X of your grid lines right on that spot on the maxillary size ledges. If it's up a little bit, it means you're pulling the camera back a little bit. If it's forward a little bit, you're, you're, you're pushing the camera forward, you're, you're down. So you just, you just get the camera until you're on that. You want to make sure you're parallel to the eyes, okay? Make sure that we have that going on there because remember, we started with the camera at that same level, so we're seeing a very accurate two-dimensional image. And this is the problem with photography is that if we don't have a square camera, it's amazing how much it changes things. Okay, this is her incisal plane, very pleasant, very pleasing, nice smile, N nothing to do here, right? But look what happens if I move the camera a little bit from below up, okay? In other words, I'm just a little bit low, like taking a picture in the chair. Look what it does to her perceived size of plane. It completely reverses it. And that's just because I'm shooting the picture from a little bit low up, okay? And it, it, it aberrates the picture a lot. And you can see in the ghost image where it should be. Uh, it should be here, not there. Now, what happens if we shoot from above down? Look what it does. We're shooting from above down, it accentuates the curve, and again, it gives us false information. We could never use this to try to verify a mounting in an articulator. If we, you know, if we don't coordinate with our clients and they don't take the pictures properly, we don't, and everybody on the team doesn't understand all this, it's going to be a losing battle the whole way through. Okay, so again, I just wanted to give a little insight into, you know, why this is so important. And again, remember. Um, if you have a line on the floor, you can have the patient straddle that and put the tripod on the floor, and that keeps your left to right straight as well. And I get this a lot. I mean, wh what kind of good is this going to do me as a photo to verify a stick bite, right? Nothing. So, again, educating our clients is, is, is really, really important. And let's go back to the teeth and talk about what's going on here. The anterior guidance separates the posterior teeth, and the posterior guidance determines how much. OK, that's basically what's going on. OK, the anterior guidance separates the posterior teeth. The posterior guidance determines how much. So delicate biters move the powerful chewers out of the way. Right. So we don't so they don't destroy themselves to the nutcracker effect. That's the key to this whole thing. Oh, excuse me. The system really is brilliant, okay, that the posterior teeth separate as soon as the mandible moves. But if this fails to happen, what we get interferences, and those can be quite destructive, okay? So articulators are set to 25 to 30 degrees, typically. A human skull is more like 50 to 60. We talked about this before. Why? OK, the reason why is because if we have less cosmic guidance, 25 to 30, we get less posterior disclusion. OK, and there's some implications to this. OK, at 25 to 30 degrees, that's a 25 degree line right there. It means that we can only bring our cuss tips up so far, you know, before we start to create interferences. So what it does is it makes it forces us to lower the wall angles between the fossa and the cusp in order to clear it in lateral and protrusive movements. So it softens the occlusal table and softens the depth of it. Usually we have to pick our pick our fossa up just a little bit. Now, if we're, if we're at 50 to 60 degrees, we can make a much steeper cusp fossa wall angle, <clears throat> okay? But that increases the chance of interferences in the mouth. So it's actually a safety factor that we use when we drop our conjure guidance down so that we lay our cusp a little flatter in the back so we get a little more clearance in, in lateral and protrusive movements so we definitely increase our chances of avoiding interferences. That's the point. But as we do this, we soften the teeth a little bit, 
<clears throat> and and we potentially decrease their mastication efficiency. So maybe, you know, in a pursuit of being safe, maybe we don't keep the teeth quite as sharp and as able to chew well uh, as they, maybe they could do. But again, it's all a matter of balancing all this out so we get the best, most practical result out of what we do. So I'm kind of a firm believer in the 30 degree um, idea for setting my articulator, although we will change that if we need to. And here's what I'm talking about. How do you determine the right contra guidance angle of a case? You set it to the lowest number that will eliminate all balancing interferences, okay? And this is a concept I think that maybe confuses some people, but I'll, I'll try to clarify that. And why the lowest? Because I want the lowest possible number I can get to get the most exclusion in, in the patient's mouth when I actually go there, okay? Like here, I've got it set to 60, but you can see my posterior is separating quite a bit back there on those flat grinding teeth. I probably wouldn't have to go that high and I would probably dial this back a little bit in a real case. But for example, I want to show this. Again, we're balancing between <clears throat> um, anatomy and function, chewing efficiency and missing uh, interferences. No, you know, or you could use protrusive bites and I'll talk a little bit about that, how that's done in a minute. But here's the important thing. Increasing conjugate guidance separates posterior teeth quicker in protrusion and on the balancing side. Remember, not on the working side. It has no effect on the working side because remember, that working condyle doesn't move. It doesn't go down the eminence. It, it conjure guidance doesn't affect it. It just rotates. And so you need to remember, you cannot clear interference <clears throat> Excuse me, on the working side. You can't do it, not with conjure guidance, okay? But here's a case here where we went into a, a, a lateral movement, okay? And all of a sudden, lo and behold, all the teeth are not touching in lateral, which means we move the mandible to the right here in this case, which means that something else is lifting off those teeth. What is it? And the first place you look is in the back, and you can also see that our cuspid isn't even touching, okay? This is why I always want to study model and a new one with a case so I can check this and set my conjure guidance. And what we have is a massive balancing interference back here that's actually lifting off these teeth on the other side of the arch, all right? Now, the truth is the patient can't have this. If the patient had this, they would be in such pain and trauma, okay, that this doesn't exist. So what's going on here? What's going on is that the patient's conjure guidance is higher than we have our articulator set. Now, this doesn't happen in every case, but we check it on every case. A lot of times we can leave them at 30, but not always. Okay, in this case, we zipped it up to 60 degrees. And then lo and behold, look, boom, I've got cuspid guidance. I've got posterior disclusion. I've got a little bit of group function going on here in the anterior, which is just fine. Okay, and I've got posterior disclusion when I go into that lateral movement. Boom. Okay. That's what we're looking for. Now, in reality, I would dial this back a hair until these teeth just cleared because that's what I want to do. Okay. Is just clear them with the lowest possible angle. So I produce the lowest possible uh, cusp fossil wall angles on my posteriors. Now, I hope this is clear, but we can talk about this more later if, if you want to. And I'm going a little fast because I got a lot of stuff in here to, 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 to cover. But protrusive bites are something the doctor can do. They're not all that easy to take, but the idea is this, that if we have two different conjure guidances, they're going to create two different amounts of posterior disclusion. Okay, the higher the guidance, the more the disclusion. So if the doctor takes a bite there, it's not going to fit, right? It's not going to fit when our articulator is set to the wrong guidance angle. Okay, we're going to have to increase it to get that bite to fit. So that's the same idea. We loosen up the, the conjure lock. We let the teeth slide forward. We put the protrusive bite in place, and we move the conjure guidance until they settle into the bite. And in this case, the, the, the guidance angle is not steep enough. Okay, we have to increase it. And then when we do increase the guidance angle, they'll drop into place. And conversely, if you see the posterior open, you know, we've got this situation. The conjure guidance is too steep. We need to roll it back the other way, and then it'll it'll pop in. So, you know, we can do it this way, and it, it really helps us get that set right for the case. Um, I personally don't get these too often. Sometimes we do, and we, when we see a really high excessive wear case, I want to get my articulator set right. But 
typically we find that um, just by eliminating balancing interferences on the models, we're pretty good, okay, without having to have this. But protrusive bites let us set the maximum allowable conjure guidance angle. And that allows us to make the maximum allowable cusp fossil angles, which allows us to make the most efficiently masticating teeth, okay, with the sharpest cusps, okay. And you can take lateral bites, which will give you the bitted angle, but I have never found that to be really all that necessary. And, and again, just, you know, here we're going to look at, you know, we all know about guide tables and capturing the, the lingual inclines of, of the anterior teeth, okay, which we need to do anytime we're prepping away teeth that provide guidance alone. If there's group function and we're doing one of the teeth, we really don't need this. But the anterior guide table that we're all familiar with, okay, basically uh, needs new accurate study models because teeth do change. So we want to make sure we get fresh models from the dock. We want to make sure that <clears throat> we capture the proper heart envelope of function, which, of course, remember, is the anterior component only. But you have to make sure you eliminate any balancing interferences first before you make this or we'll be wrong. So make sure you check your articulator that you don't have this situation going on before you make a guide table. All right. And it does represent the steepness of the maxillary linguals. And again, the pin that we use is this pin. And this pin, actually, we designed this years ago, and we kept hollow, we kept grinding on a pin until it, it actually kept, it got out of its own way. Okay, the big bullnose pins, they, they get in their own way, and you can't make an accurate guide table with those. But this pin, which at one time was actually called the Philastri pin, is available from Dana Arts called the Anterior Determiner. And what's interesting is that when we found the shape that actually worked well, it mimicked the shape of a maxillary incisor. Kind of interesting, but makes sense. So I would, I would, I would say you should have a pin like this before you uh, try to make guide tables if you want them to be accurate and they need to be accurate. So we talk about function, and I'm really running way behind on time here. I'm so sorry. I'm running late, but, but let me hurry on through this. Arc of closure is incredibly important, all right? So if we just take a compass and draw the arc, of different articulators where the condyles are relative to the teeth, look what happens, okay? They're completely different. And if we look at all three, I mean, look at this. The arc moves forward as the condyle moves down from a real articulator to a metal hinge to a plastic articulator. And if we if we dig into this just a little bit, look at this. That's physiologic. That's articulator. The mandible actually swings backwards slightly as it moves down. OK, if you look at a hinge, which is the next best thing, I guess, is the, 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 the mandible moves a little bit more vertically. And on a plastic articulator, it moves absolutely almost straight vertical. And this is a huge problem, particularly if you're opening vertical. OK, if you're just doing a single crown and running around, it's not not that big a deal. But if you're opening vertical or mud open vertical, this becomes extremely critical. And so to show this, I basically took a case and, and put it on both articulators. I put it on a plastic articulator, a little Orbix, and on my 320 articulator. So um, I just I opened vertical a lot to show this, okay, and and just made a little um, Emacs little little stint there, and then checked the uh, occlusion, and. I marked it on the articulator and I marked it on plastic and check this out on the articulator. Our centric was back there and on the plastic. However, it was up there and that's because of the way that the hinge axis moves on opening. That's a lot. Now what you'll see in real life when you open a millimeter or so is not this much, but it's enough to completely screw up your case. OK, it's a lot of anterior posterior movement of the contact point just because of the, of the arc of closure. Again, another reason to really always go with a face bow, particularly if we're thinking about opening vertical of uh, any type uh, like dentures or anything like that. Or if we're doing a big full arch case or maybe opposing full arch cases where we know we're going to be opening vertical for convenience because we've got to re really try to fit our teeth in there and design them in the best way. We need to have the ability to open vertical if necessary. All right. So, <clears throat> you know, we can get into the basically the right zone using the, the, uh, the, the uh, uh, mounting platform. But in many cases, a face bow is, um, is, is, is good or better. 
But the, here, you never know when you're opening vertical. Here's a perfect example of lower incisors. We got this case, and you know, we said, "Hey, doc, you know, if you if we're going to do this upper, we should take a look at these cases, open this vertical, so we can restore these incisors." And you know, believe it or not, he didn't think about that. All right, but again, so here's a case where we're going to be opening vertical. So if we're not in a, in a reasonably physiologic place, it's never going to work. But this one here, the lateral arc is probably bothers me a little bit more when it comes to function. And so all I did was take an articulator um, and, and a plastic hinge articulator, mark the condyles, mark the cuspid, okay, and then draw the arcs with, with, a, with a compass from that cuspid and from that conjular position. And this is really interesting because this is exactly the opposite of what goes on when we talk about opening vertical on the hinge axis. Take a look at this. On their articulator, the teeth move, move almost directly sideways, whereas on a little uh, plastic articulator, they move backwards very fast as they go sideways, all because of where the condyle is. So if we take a look at these angles and translate them back here, it makes a huge difference in where our cusps move across each other when we go in lateral. This is huge, okay? This right here, I mean, we trust me, we mess up every single crown we do in terms of cusp placement and cusp length because of this. And here's a perfect example. On the articulator, on the hinge, take a look at this, okay? And again, I use this double uh, mounting to do this. But look here, look where these two cuspids are. Uh, when, when, we're, when we're in lateral, the, the distals are almost end to end. Look where they are here. They're in a completely different position. That condyle, that mandible has moved backwards a lot relative to where it should be. And look at this. I actually have a slight working interference on this side, on that cuss tip. I need to shorten that cuss tip a little bit. But look at this one. What am I going to do with this? If I see this, I'm going to go, oh, well, I actually don't have the best B curve here. I'm going to lengthen that cuss tip a little bit, okay, and bring that down, make the curve a little better. What's going to happen in the mouth? It's going to be adjustment city, okay? So, you know, <clears throat> particularly when we're doing um, more than one crown, it's really, really important we understand this and start considering using an articulator uh, to help avoid these kinds of situations, okay? Uh, because, again, you can look at this, you know, on these kinds of articulators, there's no function going on whatsoever, okay, in terms of physiologic function. It's all teeth just grinding along teeth, and we just utilize, we harmonize tooth guidances, which is fine, <clears throat> okay, as long as you know when you can do this and when you can't do this, okay. And here's a case that I just use as an example of all this, you know, where at 25 degrees, we saw some balancing interferences here, okay. At 60 degrees, they were gone on the first buy, but still a little something on the second buy. So the patient either has a small balancing interference in group function, or uh, they're even higher than 60 degrees, which is not that uncommon, okay. But articulators don't do it, and we never go higher than that. So we're going to assume that. But what if we turn this into a quadrant, into a plastic articulator, or into a quadrant, and take away the balancing side teeth? Okay, and this is what always happens uh, on 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 uh, the quadrant with quadrant models. So you can't compensate for having just a quadrant model by putting it on a real articulator. In fact, it's really not what you want to do, okay, because, again, we're locked into the geometry. But as soon as we remove that other side, suddenly all the guidance, all the balancing side guidance is done by tooth guidances only. So, of course, we're going to have massive um, interferences, and there's no posterior exclusion, right? because we have no cuspid on the opposite side and no anterior component is involved. So we're back to that example where we're looking at posterior component and had no anterior teeth. That's what we've got going here. So, you know, understanding this, though, is really important. You may choose maybe not to want to make this crown on this kind of a situation if possible, all right? Because here's the real situation as opposed to what we're seeing on this articulator. And what it does is we perceive this big interference, this balancing side interference on this case here, which really isn't there. So we will grind this down flat, which you need to do 
to get it <clears throat> to harmonize without any anterior component and we will screw this crown up unnecessarily it's kind of a shame because if we look at the real situation of the mouth on, on a real articulator we notice oh that balancing interference wasn't even close to being there <clears throat> okay we don't have that this one is there we saw it before you know, it's, it's a very minor balancing interference, which the patient obviously has because we're at 60 and we still have it, right? And we end up grinding that tooth down unnecessarily, that crown unnecessarily, uh, which makes it less pretty, okay? Now, going back to the use of the articulator, and I, I went over this, I'm sorry, but um, the perceptual alignments of the articulator that help us keep the horizontal horizontal and the vertical vertical. I want to show you this case real quick. <clears throat> this is a crime. I got this case from a doctor, and this patient had lived with this for a long time. And like most patients, she really didn't, you know, have the ability to talk to the doctor about not accepting this case back when. Unfortunately, patients think because it's a doctor, he knows what he's doing. And we know this is not necessarily true. But we actually got this case to redo. And the doc sent me the picture of the face bow. He sent me the models. We mounted the, we mounted the case up. We, we saw that we were short on this side, which is what we perceived from our mounting. We, we, I took a look at this picture. Went, yeah, that looks okay, right? It's kind of parallel to the eyes, although where are the pupils? I don't really know in this picture. Okay. We did our wax up. We lengthened that side. We got the, we got the incisal plane horizontal to the tabletop. We got our midline vertical. We got everything perfect, and it goes for delivery, full arch case, and oh, my God, look what we got shoot you know we look at this line i try to here's a picture you sent me it's best i can get and you know huh we're off a little bit on that cuspid but it's not as much as it seems from her smile so i went back and started looking back at the stuff this is where she started still better but what happened so went back to these original pictures, and the first thing I did was go, well, actually, I think her pupil is probably up there behind that eyelid, but can I really use that? See, I really can't verify with this picture. So what about, ah, I'll use that fold. That probably is symmetrical from side to side. So let's call that the horizontal axis, and if we do look at our face bow, it was wrong, okay? But I had no way to verify that at the time. And if I if I if I adjust this based on the horizontal axis, you can see how off it really is. The face will need to go back the other way a lot, okay, in order to be correct for the horizontal. So what we proceed on the face on, on the articulator was wrong. The whole thing needed to go that away, okay. Now once it does that, suddenly that left side doesn't look long anymore, okay. <clears throat> And now we realize that the uh, right side is too long on this case, okay? So we had to go back and revamp everything because of the nature of the, the cant that we got by a, just a slightly mistaken face bow, okay? So <clears throat> had we once we correct the face bow by that three or four degrees, it does that to our case, changes everything. And of course, you got to be careful about the lip. I mean, her lip kind of goes every which way, all right? It's, it's yes, we want to follow the curvature of the lip, but within reason when we're doing cases like this. So now we've got a horizontal case that is right, but it took a redo, <laughs> took a redo to do it. So to review the important concepts from today, um, things that really you should take home. The anterior guidance separates the posterior teeth. The posterior conjugate guidance determines how much. Simple concept. You can determine that with protrusive bites, which really are nice if you can get them, or by just eliminating balancing side interferences on the articulator by what? Increasing the conjugate guidance. Okay. The anterior guidance is captured with an anterior guide table. Again, use a modified pen. If you don't want to buy one, make a little maxillary incisor, skinny it down, and grind your bullnose pens. They will not make an accurate guide table. No matter what you do, you can't do it. Okay. Um, but again, you only need this if the prep tooth alone provides any guidance. 
So generally cuspid to cuspid, but any cuspids that are involved will typically always do a guide table. But sometimes the patient functions well with group function and lateral with the cuspid, maybe a first buy or maybe lateral central combination, in which case we won't use a guide table. If any teeth are providing the proper guidance, we won't make one. Okay, but you always do want a new study model because trust me, that six-month-old model is no longer accurate. You've got to eliminate the balancing interferences and protrusive interferences first. Why not the working interferences? You should be able to answer this because the working condyle doesn't translate. It rotates, it doesn't move down the eminence, and it doesn't add any disclusion to the case. Okay, so you cannot adjust out working interferences with the, the conjugate guidance. Okay, use the lowest possible guidance angle to remove them <clears throat> so that you get the lowest acceptable cusp fossil wall angle on the teeth that you make so they are as good of a chewer as you can possibly make with the most robust anatomy and deepest occlusal tables that you can make because that does help break up the foods when the patient is chewing. It helps break open the cell walls on your vegetables, release all the good stuff. So it's nice if we can make the uh, the, the, the occlusal a little bit more gnarly, okay? So <clears throat> basically, I think you guys already know this, all small design cases, you have to use an articulator because you've got to have control over the horizontal axis. You've got to have control over the vertical axis, and you, it cannot be arbitrary or be guesswork, okay? Anytime we're doing cuspids, now we're talking about guidance, not perception, okay? More than three anterior preps are doing cuspids, okay? We need a guide table generally in this kind of situation. We have to have uh, an articulator for that. Is a facebook required um, or proper stick bite? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. And or, or both. Hey, if I, if I get a face bow, I want that stick by two doc because I've got to verify that it's right. Cause if it's not, you can see what happens on this case that we just showed. Okay. Anytime you're making a correction. Okay. You have to have these tools to get it right. Okay. Whether in, if you're opening vertical in particular in any usual situations, we definitely want our casts on an articulator in a relatively physiologic position. OK, the occlusal stand alone is great if there's no correction necessary, if we're not trying to transfer an occlusal plane or incisal plane issue into the articulator to fix it. Uh, we found over the years that this absolutely uh, provides us really good results in the mouth. To be at that bond wheel position is really um, good, in my opinion. But it ensures good alignment. It ensures the midline is in the middle of the articulator parallel to the incisal pin, the occlusal plane is fat parallel to the horizon, and then we produce our case that way. And it's it's a little bit easier than a face bow. But for those people that believe in face bows, and I do absolutely in the right situations, I just it's just it's it's very practical though to know when we do and when we do not need some of the tools that we have at our at, at our disposal. Okay, but I'll post here is anytime you have more than two or three consecutive teeth, you want to articulate, you don't want to get caught in this situation here. OK, and so that's it for this one. Sorry, I ran over and went kind of fast, but I really wanted you to get all this stuff. And next week we'll meet again at the same time and we're going to dive into how do we get all this stuff to work in the computer and understanding and utilizing virtual articulation in a way that's practical and works really well. And with that, we are done. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Well, thank you, Al. That was a wonderful presentation this week, and uh, we look forward to uh, seeing the next piece of it. Uh, I think you've blown them all away. There aren't really any questions at the moment. <laughs> uh, that's okay. No, no, that's okay. I mean, what I are you, you going to say, right? It's because I covered every freaking thing you could cover on this. There you go. I think maybe they're going to save them and then just blast you next week. So We'll see. Uh, We'll see. We'll see. But anyway, everyone, thank you for attending today. Uh, I'm sure you noticed that Al uh, really does know what he's talking about. And this is more education than you get in many different places. So uh, we're grateful that you're that you're attending with us. This uh, will be recorded so you can go back and use it again if you'd like. Um, 
you just go to webinars at uh, www.whipmix.com. Let me say and something with that, real quick. Yeah, sure, Al. Next week, when we dig into version articulation, of course, all these same rules apply. And, you know, the whole idea about balancing working interferences, conjure guidance, eliminating them, all these different things and finding them, identifying them, um, we'll be going over that stuff all again next week, but, but, but in a digital environment rather than an analog environment. Okay, super. That takes us uh, to both uh, avenues, uh, both digital and analog, and that's uh, probably what all of us at the moment need to know. So we thank everyone once again for being here. Thank you, Al, for the presentation. Sure. And we'll uh, talk to all of you next week. Bye-bye. Yeah, see you next week. Bye-bye.